talk a little bit about this gap filler concept? I know it's something you talked about before, and like yeah. a lot of companies have something like that. Yeah, I, I think it's a great concept, both early and late. I think early, when you're five to ten people, it's probably worth just hiring somebody uh, to dive in and just do all the things that need to get done in a company that um, you can effectively delegate to a smart, hungry person. Um, and so, uh, you know, we had somebody that, that you referred to us actually, a caller who did that. Um, and a lot of companies I know sort of bring in that person. They can do everything from office management to the first marketing deck to, you know, setting up payroll to whatever's needed to get done to sort of be successful. I think as a company gets later, um, people sometimes either have a COO do that, sometimes they have a biz ops team, which is really effectively an internal consulting org, or sometimes they'll have a chief of staff, and that'll effectively be like a larger company gap filler. Yeah. And it's really, I mean, um, a lot of really successful, I didn't realize um, they might get Twitter kind of play that role, but. Chris Cox did that at Facebook. He sort of like jumped in in a bunch of different places and sort of just took over the org for a while and mm -hmm. fixed it and then handed it off. Or Solar, I think, did that at Google. Yeah, Ruchi did that at Dropbox. So I think every company as it scales has at least one of those people. And often they're most needed when you don't have a real executive layer or you're building it out. And you need somebody to say, OK, now go fix HR. Now go fix recruiting. Now go fix you know, finance. And they're people who may not be versed in it, but they're smart and they can just sort of hold down the fort for a little while and help hire in the person that will take it over. You have tips or ideas on how you can identify those people? Or, I mean, it seems like a, yeah. it's like a unicorn. How do you even find those people? Yeah, I think they uh, need three characteristics. Uh, number one is... Somehow I'm not surprised that you have exactly three characteristics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I really have two, but I'll make up the third. So, you know, got to keep charging ahead and always out, out doing the numbers. Um, so uh, number one is they need to have the trust of the CEO or founders. Because if they don't, because they're in a really precarious situation, right? They're coming in and they're trying to fix something that's probably broken because when things scale really rapidly, everything breaks and that's normal. And so it's probably broken. And um, the people there may not be happy that this person's parachuting in. And the CEO may have a very strong mindset about how to do things. One of the things um, you know, I'm always um, surprised by, not surprised, I mean, it makes sense, is if you think about it, if you have an engineering founder, then they're never going to doubt or question engineering processes. They're like, oh yeah, of course we do code reviews, or oh yeah, of course you know, uh, we're gonna have these types of scrums. But they often want to reinvent every other part of the business. We need to reinvent HR, and we need to reinvent sales, and we, you know, these aren't real things. They're liberal <laughs> arts people, you know, like what do they know? And so um, I think that there's this really strong perception that those things aren't their own disciplines, and they are. And there's been you know 40 years of enterprise sales for software that works really well. Like you shouldn't go and make up some shit. Um, there's one well-known company that uh, for years didn't think that there should be variable comp for salespeople because engineers didn't get it. And so they didn't do it and their sales team was awful and that was one of the reasons. And so um, you know, I think uh, the first thing you need is that trust of the founder or CEO because they're going to trust you to say, you know what, we should just do the standard stuff here and we can try and invent stuff along the edges, but let's just try it this way for a while. Um, so that's one. So they need that trust. Uh, two, they need to be low ego because they're going to hand off stuff and they're not going to power build definitionally. Um, so that's really important. And then third, they need to be sort of logical, analytical, calm. You know, the, the people that they are working with need to sort of feel at ease around them and feel like they're doing things for the right reasons. I think Sundar at Google was a great example of that, where he was always, whenever you were in a meeting with him, he would always be focused on um, uh, doing the right thing for Google, not for himself. And so that caused a lot of trust in the organization for him. Interesting. Do you, have, do you have thoughts on how you identify those people? Those are great characteristics, but are there like patterns to where you find these people? Or is it, are they truly unicorns and they just sort of like... Um, I, I feel like, like they, I feel like they kind of self-emerge because effectively what I've seen happen is often the founders start building more and more trust in an individual over time and they see them being successful in things. And then eventually they just start throwing them into things to help. Um, so I think often it's organic if it's truly like somebody who's running corporate strategy or something. Sometimes you'll hire the person in. So for example, Square did that for BizOps, um, where they explicitly hired somebody in to come and do internal consulting mm -hmm. and do that as sort of a function. Gotcha.